Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Tonight, we bring you a special report that highlights the unprecedented pressures facing nurses and doctors in the NHS. Over the past week, BBC News has been given exclusive access to the Royal Blackburn Hospital, which was once in special measures but is now rated good. Its a &E department receives more ambulances than any other in the northwest of England. In the first of two reports, our special correspondent, Ed Thomas, has been speaking to staff and the patients they treat. There are distressing images in what comes next. Inside the Royal Blackburn Hospital. The BBC was given unrestricted access to witness the pressures facing the NHS. They've been patients here for six and eight hours. Can't find a bed for them. Queuing for five hours in the corridor. It's not what you expect for a country like ours, is it really? What's it like here when it's busy? Dangerous. Yeah, it's, it's frightening. Are you ready to run a blood gas? Sunday night, a peak time in this A&E. 95 patients and just 33 cubicles and rooms. The sickest are seen first. We actually have corridor nurses now as well, which is, shows times are very desperate. The priority is to keep people safe. Across the week, we saw patients treated on corridors and side rooms. I feel as though I'm going to collapse if I don't get laid down. You need a bed. Definitely. It's distressing. It's really distressing for people. How long have you been waiting for? Seven hours. We need beds and staff. It's just like banging your head against a brick wall. We're in hospital, you need some privacy. I mean, I am covered up, but it's not nice. At its busiest, this was the paediatric emergency department. These nurses and doctors are working really hard, but there just isn't enough of them. There's people lined up in corridors on beds. There's people stood up all in here, there ain't even enough seats to sit down. It's absolutely appalling. The amount of babies that are, that are sat on corridors is absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. It's heartbreaking. Is there anywhere for you to sit down? No, the waiting room is full. They just put me here. We've been studying for four ten minutes. How do you feel about all of this? Frustrated. Worried. Is it going to take something drastic for me to act quicker? We used to come, we used to wait a bit in A&E. At least you'd have a seat. Now we're sat in a four. No, it's worrying. As a doctor, how do you feel when you see babies like that? It's unfair. It's unfair, even though it's putting us in a, you know, under big pressure. By Monday morning, on average, patients were spending half a day in the emergency department. So let the staff get on with what they're doing. Those delays are difficult to take for consultants like Helen. I left here at 11 o'clock one night, having referred him into the hospital um, earlier to about 10, 9, 10 o'clock. And I arrived back at 11 o'clock the next morning and he was still here. 12 hours in A&E? Yeah, more than. What did that do to you when you came back in and you saw your patient? It was Stop. upsetting. It was upsetting. Because you know it's not the care that you would want your own family to receive. I'm going to go and see what I can do to shift beds and create space. Even paramedics queue. During our time here, the A&E only hit its four-hour waiting target on one day. When you get 12 ambulances in an hour, you know, you're going to have queues like this. And as a team, we work exceptionally hard. Like, it's not that anything's going wrong. It's the sheer volume of people that come. There's only so much that we can do. Have the doctor been in? No. The demands of a modern A&E. More and more older patients arriving with complex acute conditions. And staff say there are increasing addiction and mental health problems. I can't send him back home until he's been assessed by the mental health team. To deal with these growing pressures, the A&E has a frailty doctor. Started having sciatica pain two days ago. So a GP and dedicated alcohol and mental health nurses. We see up to 300 people a month. 
alcohol dependent patients, most of them. We've got a gentleman who's been here 1,060 times. What's that doing to this hospital? Well, it's 1,060 ambulances, 1,060 attendances. Yeah, I'm hearing voices. Chris is also an alcoholic. He's homeless with mental health problems. For the last three months since I came out of prison, I, 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 I've been sleeping in a toilet. In a &E. Well, in the, in the main part of the building. For him, it looks like he's feeling safe here. He can talk to people. So in the morning, he'll be fine. He'll walk is, out. is that what a and &E is for? This is not what a and &E is for, but this is what we've been uh, living in today's world. Facing these constant demands, nurses like Rachel and Lloyd. Is this what you're expecting when you join? Not to the not no. to the extent. How we've had it the past three months, we've been risking our jobs because we've been working under such a pressure. We're coming in every night, worrying about what's coming in. In the triage, it is just a trained nurse, and it's up to us to decide whether that patient is poorly if we need a doctor to see them, or whether they can wait on What's that like? It's that pressure life for both of you? It's scary. It, yeah, it is. It's hard. Mm. It's very hard. And many here wanted to talk openly. Mind the needle here. Dr Hack is a consultant. He's worked in the NHS for more than two decades. Have you ever known it like this? No. In 26 years? No. We've had pressures every now and then, but no, this is continuous. The problem is we are taking too many risks now. We're sending home patients that we shouldn't be sending. Because we know where to put them. It's dangerous. Dangerous. What should we do? That's a question for the government to answer, but uh, we need more staff, we need more space. The chief executive here allowed the BBC in to show the realities facing his staff in a hospital that's rated as good. I wanted you to see how busy we are how difficult things can be, but also in those difficult circumstances, how well those patients and their families are cared for. Is there a point when the pressure gets too much? We cannot say that, I cannot say that. We have to keep our patients safe and we will continue to do so. But trying to cope with so many patients is pushing some doctors to their limits. I was getting to the end before my week off. What would have happened to you if you did not have that week off? Uh, I don't think I could have done the job properly and I think my patients would have started to suffer. It made me cry. And it never stops. Every day, Come on, Baba, let's go. lives saved in a and &E. They've done a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You deserve more than you get. Ed Thomas, BBC News, Blackburn. So that was one week in one hospital. But it's not unique. Across the NHS, nine of ten hospitals have been overcrowded to the point of being unsafe this winter. The solutions are complex, from greater efficiency to more money. Ministers say charging patients from outside the UK for non-urgent treatment will help. Nearly three quarters of those surveyed in a poll for BBC News agree with that. Our health editor Hugh Pym has been taking a closer look at easing the pressures on the NHS. An NHS manager with a credit card machine. It's already happening at some hospitals as they try to claim back the cost of NHS care from overseas visitors who don't qualify for it. You're not entitled to free medical treatment. It's £800 a day. I don't have one, I can't really, sorry. I understand that. Um, but that's what we have to charge, sir. The government, which has been criticised for failing to collect enough money, now wants all hospitals to charge patients not entitled to free care up front for non-emergency treatment. Other countries in the EU, other countries outside the EU, like the United States, like Canada, like Australia, they charge visitors to their country for using uh, health services uh, other than in urgent cases, and we're just doing the same thing. But some argue the sums of money are small and the policy is a distraction from the real issues facing the NHS. What we mustn't do is pretend that this uh, reclaiming of money will somehow solve the problems in the NHS, which are about gross underfunding. We are several billion pounds short uh, in terms of 
providing for the needs of the population. So what are the really big challenges facing the NHS? How much of it is down to money? And what sort of resources are needed to deliver the healthcare needs of the population around the UK in the decades ahead? Total healthcare spending across the UK is equivalent to just under 10% of annual economic output. That's below France at 11.1% and Germany at 11. It might not sound much, but the difference amounts to billions of pounds annually. The number of doctors per 1,000 people in the UK is 2.8. That's below France with 3.3. The figure for Germany is 4.1. Well, I think there's a growing consensus the NHS needs more money. The question is who pays, how much and through what method. Uh, and all the research shows that the way we pay for it now, through a combination of taxes, income tax, national insurance, it's cheap to raise, it's fair, it doesn't discriminate against the poor and the unhealthy. But could the NHS make better use of resources? Here in Yeovil, they're pioneering a new approach. This one-stop shop manages the needs of frail elderly patients to avoid, if possible, costly hospital admissions. So they're seen by the nurses, a consultant, a junior doctor, a pharmacist, an occupational therapist. And if they need to see a nurse specialist, diabetes, respiratory, we will call them into the unit. So they're seen in one place. And it's partly down to all of us as patients, lifestyles and prevention of future health problems. That's got to be part of any attempt to future-proof the National Health Service. And Hugh is uh, with me now. Hugh, there are obviously long-term solutions, but they're not going to help the patients and staff we've been seeing today, are they? Well, that's right, George. A lot of long-term debate about how health and social care adapts to these challenges, the ageing population and so on. Let's not forget there are four different health systems in the UK, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland and England. They all have differing approaches. They have to make decisions about how to use their resources. But I think there's one thread across the UK this winter we've been seeing. That is the sheer volume of patients going in to hospitals, the difficulties discharging people back into the community and the shortage of beds for emergency admissions, never mind routine surgery. As we saw there in Ed's piece, and I hear it from doctors and nurses frequently, there is immense pressure. They've never seen anything uh, quite like it at the moment. And often it's because of problems in wider society. Failings may be in mental health provision or social care and those are not easily fixed and they result in people really seeing hospitals and A&E as a last resort. Hugh, thank you very much. Here, NHS trusts in England are to make patients from overseas pay up front for non-emergency care. The government says giving hospitals a legal duty to charge, they hope, will recoup up to half a million pounds a year. But critics warn the plans put more pressure on the already overstretched NHS. Our health and social care correspondent Victoria MacDonald is here. Victoria. Yes, well, John, this is the government's latest attempt to deal with what they call health tourism, so trying to get the money back for non-urgent treatment, and that must be emphasised. Currently, they bill after the event, and too often those health tourists, as it were, go back to their countries and the bill isn't paid. Now they're going to make, uh, say to trust, that they have to give the bill, as it were, before the operation happens. Uh, now, as you said, there was some concern today that this is rather a diversion from the really serious pressures that the NHS is currently under, as we've seen with A&E and um, delayed discharges and so on. And in fact, the health minister did, to a certain extent, acknowledge that today. There are wider issues, but this is an example of one of the measures that we're taking to get a grip on an obligation that already exists on the NHS. We've had this obligation since 1982. Previous governments have made no attempt to try to recover from health tourists coming to the UK uh, to undertake procedures that they perhaps can't get elsewhere. We think they need to be fair to the British taxpayer and to pay for it. So is this about recouping much needed money? Well, yes, I mean, it's, it's 500 million, they hope, a year. I mean, they're saying, to start with, maybe it will be 25 million. And actually, it's not... So that was a 50 million... Uh, yes, um, five, oh, no. no, 500 million a year is what they want to get back, mm. which is actually not that much compared with the overall NHS budget. And they say, as a start, they will, they will get 25 million, they hope. But the... the 
one of the concerns, of, of course, he's, he was saying there that, you, that previous governments haven't tried. Previous governments have, but it's very difficult for trusts, actually. It was, it's very um, difficult, you know, trying to track someone down. What does happen at the moment, though, is a, if a person hasn't paid their bill, a patient will have their name put at the border agency and they are not allowed back in the country if they haven't paid that bill. Victoria MacDonald. I've been